I was talking about osteoporosis, and I think we were to, um, we went through the risk factors, we were to diagnose this. So DXA is a bone densitometry, I believe that's how you say that. If you flip way back to page 945 on that table, um, bone densitometry is right kind of in the middle, and that's just, it's a real easy test to do. As you can see in patient preparation, no special advanced preparation is required. You just have them remove anything metal that they're wearing. Um, and then the last part on that, radiation exposure is minimal and the procedure is painless. So pretty easy test to do. The problems associated with osteoporosis, we already talked about how um, falls or easy can lead to um, fractures, so things like wrists are easier to fracture. There's some other problems that go along with it. Um, one of the real common things I see with osteoporosis in the elderly population is at least a poor fitting dentures because the jaw is made out of bone and as that, that, as that changes, um, dentures don't fit anymore. So that might be a sign that you would see when you're assessing somebody. Height, um, that's pretty well known that osteoporosis causes you to shrink in height and that's probably one of my biggest concerns. I've never been quite as tall as I wanted to be and I'm the poster child for osteoporosis and so as I'm reaching the age where my um, bones are deteriorating faster than I'm building them, I'm worried about losing some of my height and um, that's probably just um, a little bit va of vanity on my part. So let's talk about some treatments. Supplemental calcium, and if you look on the bottom of the first column on 961, it talks about um, general guidelines for calcium, and this is good to know. I've seen a few. I don't know that it's on your exam, but I know I saw it maybe on the NCLEX review. So for the typical person, 1,000 milligrams a day of calcium is a recommendation. If somebody is postmenopausal, but they're on estrogen, that remains the same because it's the reason that being postmenopausal increases your risk is the loss of estrogen. If they are postmenopausal and do not use estrogen replacement therapy, then the um, requirement increases to 1,200 to 1,500 a day of calcium. There's not a lot of contraindications to or side effects of calcium, but some are listed there: hypercalcemia, hypophosphatemia history of kidney stones. Vitamin D supplements are also advised. And then we get to estrogen replacement. And I already talked about that. It's very controversial. It's still recommended sometimes in women and as your book says, beneficial effects on the bones for up to 15 years after the onset of menopause. It has not been shown to help after that. So if someone goes through menopause at say age 55, then 65. So through age 70, there might be some benefit, at least for osteoporosis, to taking estrogen. After age 70, no. And so it's just that first 15 years. But still, um, most people don't use that because there's so many side effects, and we'll talk more about that in pharmacology. But just briefly, it's been associated with clotting disorders. So um, MIs, which is heart attack, stroke, and blood clots seem to increase and some cancers. Bisphosphonates, Fosamax and Boniva are fairly new to the market. They've been around about 15 years. I remember, and this is really important because to take Fosamax and Boniva, you have to be able to follow a lot of instructions. And the first time I saw Fosamax was um, when I first became a nurse in the late 90s. And we had this doctor at the nursing home I worked with, and he loved to prescribe this for patients who were completely incapable of taking it properly. Number one, you can't crush it. It has to be swallowed whole. And inevitably, he would um, prescribe it for patients who were on crushed mixed with alpha sauce meds. Second, you have to take it with an entire cup of water. And again, usually if someone has crushed meds ordered, they're on thickened liquids, and you can barely get them to drink a teaspoon of water, let alone an entire cup. Then they have to be able to sit up or stand up for 30 minutes after taking it. And again, he would constantly prescribe this medication for people who couldn't do any three of those. And so I discovered that this medication had been given to a lot of 
women at this nursing home and no one bothered to look the medication up and they'd been crushing it and mixing it in applesauce and doing all sorts of things wrong with it. So I vividly remember all the directions for Fosamax. That's something that is going to be on your exam. It's on the NCLEX review. You just really need to know um, the administration instructions for, for Fosamax and Boniva. The um, full cup of water, take it first thing in the morning before before you eat, upon arising, because you have to sit sit up, let gravity do its thing for 30 minutes. Don't crush it. All of those are important. Then we get to CIRM. Selective estrogen receptor modifier is what that refers to. Avista is the only one I know of on the market right now. These are pretty cool because selective estrogen receptor, receptor modifier. So in ways, Avista acts like estrogen. And the way it acts like estrogen is just in the same way that estrogen um, decreases bone loss. Avista does the same thing. However, since it's selective, it doesn't have a lot of the problems that estrogen has. And so I think we'll probably be, probably be seeing more um, CIRMs being manufactured or used because they seem to be a pretty good deal. I'm sure they have their drawbacks too, but it's, it's kind of a way of um, mimicking what estrogen does without a lot of the drawbacks to estrogen. And then, of course, weight-bearing exercise has been shown to also preserve or build bone. Towards the bottom of 961, I thought that was an interesting paragraph. That last paragraph, it talks about um, when people's vertebrae. And so pain can also be a problem with osteoporosis. And this describes why. As the vertebrae deteriorate, it can put pressure on the spinal cord. So a lot of back pain can accompany osteoporosis. And this is talking about that um, surgery. It's fairly common where they inject cement into the vertebrae to kind of shore it up. And but at the very last sentence, it says, in addition, recent research found no difference between patients who had vertebroplasty and those who had a sham procedure. So research doesn't really back this up. It makes sense that it would help um, cement those bones so that there's no spinal compression, but the research doesn't really support it. Next, we're going to talk about gout. Gout is kind of an interesting disorder. Uh, it's included here because it affects the joints and connective tissue, but we're going to talk about it again when we get into urinary tract disorders because it's related to that too. It's hyperuricemia, and uricemia comes from uric acid, and uric acid is what eventually the kidneys are able to filter out, and it makes what we call urine. So it's Sounds like urine on purpose. It's an inflammatory disease and these extra, so it's a, too much uric acid or hyperuricemia, and it's manifested by when the body can't get rid of this extra uric acid, it deposits urate crystals in the joints or other body tissues. As you can imagine, having uric acid crystals deposited in your joints is going to be quite painful. So pain is a big part of gout. Also, if we did blood tests, we would find increased levels of uric acid or serum urate levels. They'll have acute attacks of um, what's called gouty arthritis. And that's, it kind of happens in phases. So initially, the the three stages are asymptomatic. If we did a blood test, we would see elevated uric acid levels, but they don't have any symptoms. Then the, this acute gout arthritis, and the joint that is most commonly affected, interestingly enough, is, is the great toe, the, the biggest toe. And so big toe pain is um, often a sign of gout. And then after a while, uh, chronic tophaceous gout, and there's a picture of that on page 963. And you can see that those uric crystals are really trying to get out of the skin. So they're forming those little nodules on the skin. Those are called tophi, deposits of sodium urate crystals that are visible as nodules under the skin. Risk factors include genetics. So um, someone who has a history of it in the family is more likely to get it. Being male makes someone at greater risk, although I don't know if the maleness is more associated with the diet and alcohol, consuming those 
tend to have a really large risk factor associated with gout, and males are more likely to abuse alcohol and have a diet high in purines than females. So I don't know if it's related to the, just the fact that they're male or the fact that being male makes one more at risk for this. Purines kind of sounds like protein, and it is protein, but certain types of protein make one more susceptible or have more purines in them. And the way I remember my foods high in purines, oops, let me go back, is I think of, where's my picture of, ah, oh, there we go, cat food. Because if you look at the list on page 964, it's kind of in that gray purine content of selected foods. Look at what's on there. Anchovies, herring, mincemeat, sardines, goose, kidney, mackerel, um, meat extracts, heart, all of those things, and then sweetbreads, which doesn't really go with the others, but everything except for the sweetbreads, um, it sounds like flavors of cat food to me. And so here I have Purina cat food to remind you that things high in purines sounds like they would make good cat food. We'll talk about medications for gout more in pharmacology, but briefly, NSAIDs, that seems to be the treatment of choice for almost all of these connective tissue disorders because this is an inflammatory disease. Oral colchicine, and if you'll read on 963, it says, if colchicine is used, it may be given hourly until the acute symptoms ease or until the patient develops diarrhea or vomiting. Colchicine is an, a cholinergic medication, and we'll be talking a lot about cholinergic medications in um, pharmacology too, but um, for now, just know that it, it speeds up digestion, and so that's how it will help get rid of, makes you kind of poop and pee, I guess, and so you can see how that would help eliminate the uric acid real quickly, and so colchicine is used for acute attacks. It can help right here, right now. Same with NSAIDs and corticosteroids. So these are all in the acute area. So if someone's having a gouty attack, their, their big toe is killing them, they can take these things to help in the here and now. Now for chronic, meaning that this is gonna be a continuous problem, there's um, these three, and this one I've never given, but allopurinol and probenicid, I've given a lot of these. They are not going to help with the acute gouty attack, but they can help prevent acute gouty attacks. And they do it by, if the problem is too much uric acid, number one, you can um, reduce production of uric acid. Number two, you can increase the elimination of it. Or number three, you can break it down. So that's the the three ways. And so if you take this prefix, urico, uricostatic, uricosuric, and uricolytic describes the three types of medications. So allopurinol is uricostatic. It prevents urate formation. Probenicid is uricosuric. It increases the excretion or the renal excretion of uric acid. And then this last one that I said isn't used very often, peg Peglotocase is a uricolytic agent. It breaks down the uric acid. All of these can reduce the level of uric acid in the blood. And of course, they're also going to avoid purine, foods high in purine. And the, the question I saw the most commonly in NCLEX review and on your exam is something having to do with water. So if you're reading a question, test question about gout, and one of the choices is drinking lots of water, choose that because I saw numerous. Like if someone's taking allopurinol, what's a nursing thing that they have to drink lots of water? If someone has gout, what do they need to do? Drink lots of water. To prevent kidney stones from associated with gout, what do they do? Drink lots of water. So if drinking lots of water is a choice on a gout question, pick it.